nobody believed them. But eventually, in 1903, their aircraft flied around. And then the next, Amelia Earhart wanted to be uh, the first uh, female aviator. And it was not allowed for females to fly. But in 1932, Amelia Earhart became the first female aviator to cross the ocean. In 2019, Melly Maximus said, well, she designed, well, actually, she did. Take a look. Amazing, isn't it? And that was only what we already can do, until today. There were last year almost every innovation in the leisure and entertainment industry was about bringing our lives into a virtual world, or the metaverse, did Maxima Studios go the opposite direction. Our general manager said, I'd rather walk alone than with all those men going in the wrong direction. So we develop technologies that make it possible that our creations in the metaverse come to life in the real world. Today we present you the next generation of outdoor shows. Sit back and enjoy the ride. Well, in 2021, we developed the most advanced drone to change the world of outdoor events forever. Well, that's a bold statement, but we did. Let's dive into those drones for you. And I show you a little bit of the innovation behind the, our drones. Well, first of all, to bring the drones to a place, we drive with our trailers, and our trailers are equipped with solar panels with more than 6,000 watt peak. And our trailer is equipped with uh, four dynamos, for, uh, enough for 480 amp. That means our drones are recharged without any use of any energy from the net. And that means we don't leave any carbon footprint to, uh, to charge our drones. In every trailer, they fit 600 drones. And they deploy on the location in less than 10 minutes. And they are fully automated la launch with a fully automated landing and dock. Well, let's a bit more about our drones. Every drone can fly two and a half an hour on this moment and has a speed up to 200 miles per hour. They can fly in very dense clusters and they can lift three times gravity speed and drop five times gravity speed. And they have a flight accuracy of 2.44 inch in this path and a an hoover accuracy of, two of 0 0.95 inch. And they are super silent, of course, on uh, 15 feet, that's about 5 meters, they have a, a sound of 20 dB. Well, 
by the use of 5G, we can communicate with our AI server that controls our drones and the sensor re uh, prevent collisions. Each cluster of drones can contain 250 drones and with no limitation of how many drones they would do. But we need data speed, a lot of data speed. <laughs> Let's go deeper. Exact location of the 10 reference measurements to our drones. They are just lines with a several and a new patented system, and it's hard to see there. But our system for, pen, uh, for the positioning this, uh, is very patent bending. And there's the next one. Well, you see in the scene, that's how we work with our drones. We need 5G because there's no technology that has computing in the drones to save batteries. Uh, so we go further. And we have two minutes left. Go too fast. Well, our service um, based, it's an AI server. And we put an extra layer of argument reality. Uh, the QR code of, uh, starts in the air, and when you use your camera, you look at the drone show, and you have an argument reality layer that you hear, even on miles away, you can hear the sound from the show and see the show with an argument reality layer. And there it is. And the, the drones are very synchronized with every viewer. And last but not least, why should we have this challenge? Well. We are a company based in Eindhoven. I'm a female designer, and I designed the drones, worked with my team, and we built it. It's not I'm the CEO, not only, I'm also the designer. Well, um, Eindhoven, the city of light, and our drones can build a beautiful light and a beautiful light show. And Eindhoven City diverse next generation light shows, isn't it? And a female leading in the high tech world is very difficult. Even this morning, people try to take me out of the race of the show, but it doesn't happen because I'm here and I stand for you. And I hope our drone show will be the next in Eindhoven and be showed you what drones can do. Thank you for your attention. Well, during the show, I will, I will also be having a quick chat with some of our jury members. And I'm here with Alpha Moder from Vodafone. Alpha, do you think that Maximus's project can be a possible uh, replacement for the usual uh, fireworks? Um, yeah, and I also think that uh, it can be do much more than that. So uh, um, I, I, I can see it doing 3G, uh, 3G uh, uh, pictures in, in, in the sky and uh, making movies in the sky, making impressions in the sky. Um, so I, I have seen a lot of nice fireworks uh, also in Japan, but I think this is the next level. Okay, fantastic. And which lessons can we take away from the 5G Hub Innovation Challenge? Um, the lessons is that, uh, that you can bring uh, people together here. Um, so you have a small uh, entity of, of very experienced people and also uh, a lot of uh, capacity and knowledge, like a cooker pot. And uh, this brings you uh, also to the next level, so we can for sure help uh, uh, companies like, uh, like, like, like these with the drones. Yes, very F interested. Fantastic, thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, our next contestant showcases a mechanical weeding robot that uses AI to distinguish the crops from the weeds. Please welcome Oddbot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Martijn Lukaert. I am the founder and CEO of Oddbot. With Oddbot, we are accelerating the transition to sustainable agriculture. We do so by first focusing on the organic farmers to help them with their manual weeding, to then focus on the uh, conventional chemical farmers and offer them a sustainable alternative for to the full field spraying, which is still the uh, yeah, most common method to uh, manage the weeds. Here you see how it's currently being done in the organic farming. So people are laying on these uh, uh, weeding beds head first to do the picking. And it's very challenging to find stuff, to motivate them, and it's getting more and more costly. Um, also, the conventional farmers have a big challenge because the amount of chemicals they are allowed to use on the field, it's further reduced because the use of these chemicals is under heavy scrutiny. And you see that Europe is investing heavily to double the amount of organic farmland within a decade. 
and uh, reduce the amount of chemicals that are currently being used uh, by half. And last but not least, the customers, the consumers, they also demand healthy, affordable, nutritious food that is ethically sourced. And that's where we come in. We make impact on seven of the sustainable development goals and we have this autonomous mechanical weeding robot that can work day and night. Indeed, as, as uh, Leticia said, distinguish the weeds from the crops and remove them with a, a three-in-one gripper uh, that I will show in a second. And that's also the progress that we have made since uh, the, uh, uh, the rounds we had previously. We have a robot now in the field at the farmers and uh, they are testing it right now. Where we differentiate the most is really in the high precision. So the system is configured in a way that we can optimize the hand and eye coordina coordination. So at the moment of the detection, we already decide the how we are going to remove the weeds. And therefore our solution is most optimal to work in high density, high value crops. Here you see how the detection algorithm is performing. Uh, we've now put this, uh, the camera system into an um, uh, enclosure with um, artificial lighting. And we, ex we have also added an extra layer in this neural network. So we can now also detect the stems to properly remove the weeds and um, get closer to the crops. The business model uh, is currently being validated with the farmers, whereby we start with the weeding as a service, so we are like a cleaning agency, keeping the fields clean as a contract worker. Then we want to move into the robots as a service. Currently, these farmers, they spend over 100 hours per hectare to keep the field clean. So initially, uh, this is where we focus on, really help them with the manual weeding. Uh, this is a bit about the journey so far. In 2018, we have started to build the first proof of principle. In 2019, we, have, uh, we got our first funding from a proof of concept fund. We are now utilizing the field, uh, the farm of the future, um, where we collaborate with Kubota and Wageningen Research, where they help us to um, yeah, offer our, uh, the fields where we can continue the tests. Um, yeah, a bit about the team. We work with Eric, also from this uh, Eindhoven region. He was working on the Sarescon, the asparagus harvesting robot. We have Wouter, the AI lead, and uh, Dirk, who's coming from uh, Lely, the uh, uh, robot milking uh, system uh, supplier. And I myself, I'm a serial tech entrepreneur. And a bit about, a bit about the background where Oddbot started. Initially, I wanted to develop an on-demand delivery robot. We made a bit of a pivot to the agriculture because it was not yet feasible to put these robots on the, on the sidewalks. And here you see uh, how I envision the future for the robots to be. So eventually we put out a swarm of these robots on the field, which can communicate properly with each other and also learn from each other. Uh, here you see um, the system of us uh, live, uh, or this was uh, last week, uh, on the uh, ridge of, of carrots. So you see a bit of the detection unit in front, and this is what we want to further optimize with the use of 5G. So we want to um, uh, optimize the detection and the removal, um, utilizing not only the first vision box, which you see here in the front, there behind it is the, the robot uh, arm, uh, the delta arm robot with, with the gripper. This is a three-in-one system where we can push back the very small weeds back into the ground. We can open the gripper to start pulling the weeds, and if we uh, close the gripper counterclockwise, we can uh, start scooping. Um, and this whole system, we want to further optimize, whereby we use the, se the second uh, vision box as well to optimize the retraining loop and also have a human in the loop, whereby we foresee that uh, we can um, monitor the robot uh, remotely, uh, also uh, control the uh, robot re remotely, and um, if the robot is put on the field to work autonomously, that we can connect to it uh, uh, and uh, offer the remote support via uh, teleoperation or to be in a way that we can be uh, telepresent. Um, so together with the 5G hub, we really want to further develop our current uh, minimal viable product 
into the future where we have a swarm of these robots autonomously on the field. Uh, we would like to work with you guys to um, yeah, test out the, the, the 5G network, uh, the optimization in the, um, uh, in the computing, whereby we also would like to see if we can work with, let's say, a swarm intelligence, have uh, higher intelligent nodes and the lower intelligent nodes, so that we can uh, really speed up the development uh, together with you, uh, with Eindhoven region, and uh, with our partners um, uh, together. So I look forward to hopefully uh, winning this and otherwise at least continue to collaborate together because I uh, really see uh, this as the future and the connectivity, uh, in my opinion, is, is key to speed up the retraining and enable the nature to communicate its needs with robots and us humans so we can work in, a, uh, uh, in, in synergy. Thank you very much. I'm here with CFO and founder of AirCision, Betsy Lindsay. Uh, Betsy, uh, when we think of the future of farming, how do you see robots like the Oldbot being used? Uh, I really believe that that this solution is taking you know, our, our use of data to the next level. So precision farming has been around now for years where they use satellite and GIS to give us more information about what's on the field. But I think this takes it down to the ground level and really gives farmers the information they need to, to you know, get the, the, the smart farming done and, and really use less pesticides and things like that. So I think it's a really smart solution. Okay, and uh, in your opinion, what is the importance of events like the 5G Hub Innovation Challenge? Uh, networking and connection. I think, you know, just getting your solution out there and getting the help that you need is about communicating to, to the co ecosystem, to the community. So, yeah. Okay. And as an experienced entrepreneur, would you share with our contestants the best piece of advice you were ever given? Mm. Uh, I guess I, I've probably said this before at other events, but I think it is about performance to plan. So basically, if you say in a pitch that we're going to do this by this date, if you show everybody that you're going to do that and you have done it, then people start believing you and following you. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice is just make a plan that's, that actually is executable and deliver. Amazing, thank you very much, Bex yeah, Betsy. Of course. Uh, our next contestant developed a throwable robot that can detect how safe the environment is. Please welcome Sita Robotics. So good after afternoon, everybody, from the jury and also digitally present. We are Bart van Leeren and Daniel Meetman from Sita Robotics. And in the next few minutes, we will hope to explain what 5G could bring to us. Well, just imagine, we are an entrepreneur <laughs> and we um, own an office building. In the middle of the night, uh, a dog starts to bark very furiously. Shit. Alarm. The control room doesn't see anything and the control room also doesn't know anything what's going on. Luckily, they have a robot driving around to verify the problem. Great! The alarm has been verified within seconds. The entrepreneur can luckily stay asleep. <coughs> this is a short, short sketch of the problem we actually want to tackle and how we want to tackle it. The, uh, at this point, alarms are 89% false, and the responder needs to, the control room needs to call the responder, the responder needs to go to the site, and by that point it might take up 30, 30 minutes. If then, for example, a dog or a spider set off the alarm, the danger is long gone, so the responder can't see anything and doesn't know what the problem actually was. So we at CETA Robotics believe that the lack of information should not be the limiting factor when working in a complex operation, and especially the, the, the process making should be gone smoothly, so that every move needs to be planned, especially when the risks are high. With our solution, it's become possible to gather information quickly and easily, uh, and with this information network, improve the situation awareness and the overall efficiency. 
So of course we don't do this by ourselves, but we have gathered a team of young, enthusiastic engineers around us uh, doing our developments. Uh, you see we have mechanics, mechatronics, software, electronics, and it's great to work together with them. Here a small impression of what we have achieved so far. So uh, together with the Ministry of Defense, we have designed and developed multiple systems which are actually currently being developed, tested in the field. And the first results look very promising. So let's go back now to our original problem from the security market. And how could we actually solve this? Well, uh, when as soon as the alarm goes off, the, the um, uh, off-site security guard gets informed, and the robots that are already uh, physically lo uh, located at the building will move towards the point of interest and try to find out what the cause might be of the alarm. As soon as, it, uh, as the alarm has, uh, the in, uh, the, an indication has found, it gives feedback uh, to the officer, which could decide to call for extra help. So potential benefits are having a portable set of eyes, which are able to uh, monitor multiple locations at the same time, um, doing automating dull and dirty work, having everything centralized, and also being able to document and record what has happened, and of course, an overall cost reduction. So let's briefly, very briefly, look at some technologies that will be required in order to do this. Um, in order to autonomously uh, have the robots uh, drive around without intervening from the user. So first of all, we need pre precise, accu or we need accurate um, tracking of the actual robots, um, so that, that they can autonomously navigate towards the point of interest. Secondly, um, the, the robot needs to know what is happening around it, uh, around him. So it needs sensors in order to uh, 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 alter or change when, when situations have changed. And finally, a, a more complex algorithm, smart algorithms are required in order to uh, compare the current situation with the new situation and find out what the actual problem of the alarm was. And all that data cannot be processed by the robot itself, since the robot needs to be accessible, but also very small. Um, therefore, the data will be sent to the cloud, as you can see in the slide, and then go to the control room. In the control room, they can see the video feed, and back-end servers will actually do the movement and do the autonomous behavior. If the control room then decides that there's actually there's something needs to happen, the control room can make the decision, call additional help, and a video feed will be sent to the archive for documenting, so in the future they can use that on another way. Well, this is a lot of data in a very hard, small, fast pace, and 5G is actually perfect for that. 5G is very robust and has a, uh, 5G is very robust and makes it possible to send data very fast. Besides that, it's very, very, um, it's, bit that we can guarantee the uptime, sorry. Uh, besides that, 5G has a very low latency, so the calculations can go quite fast. Besides, 5G is energy efficient, scalable, and also a lot safer. Of course, we don't do this by ourselves. Uh, we work together with TMC and the BOM, and we have spoken with Trigion and NVD, and we hope that we can save, solve this problem with them together in the future. Thanks for your attention. And now I have the honor and the pleasure of talking to one of the masterminds behind the 5G Hub, industry and ecosystem manager, Stefan Kreining. Stefan, please, a big round of applause. <laughs> Stefan, what can we learn from a team like Cita Robotics? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I first want to say I'm impressed I am with all the presentations we've seen so far. And knowing the ones that are upcoming, I really want to thank everybody for their huge effort in this track. I think one of the things we can really learn from, uh, from CETA is that they've looked outside in and they've seen an issue, they've applied the solution to it and they formed a team around it to cover that solution. But the solution itself is also broad enough to make it applicable for many more environments and solutions. So it addresses a very, very um, uh, large need, safety, security, which can be replicated in many, many environments.
Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Our next contestant is, has a very futuristic project with ephemeral advertising. Please welcome Tata Alexi. Hi, Midak. Good afternoon. My name is Arun, and I'm from Tata Alexi. Today, we'll, I'll be presenting our concept of ephemeral ads. At Tata Alexi, we believe that the future is vision to scale. We all know the number of devices, connected devices, is increasing year on year. In fact, eMarketer predicts that by 2026, the number of connected devices will be close to 30 billion, twice the number of devices that we have connected today. <coughs> Alexas, connected cars, connected fridges, everything that can be connected will be connected in the future. More number of devices connected would mean, would mean the crave for more content from the users. And more content would mean more opportunities for the ad, ad service providers and retailers to be able to push ads to the user and monetize those ads. However, what we have seen is the experience of ads has not been that great. So a simple Google search would show that the ads are not considered to be the best. We believe that the 5G will transform the ad delivery of the future. And 5G-powered 5G ephemeral ads is one such concept that I'll be presenting today. Let me take a minute to explain what ephemeral ads would mean. Ephemeral, by definition, means something which is short-lived. In the digital world, we can take an example of a Snapchat message, which is probably short-lived, a WhatsApp status, which is probably short-lived. But when it comes to 5G, the short-lived would mean probably a few milliseconds or a few seconds. To explain how this would work in the ad industry, let me play a short video. In a rapidly changing world, ad experience matters. With 5G, ads can be transformed. Let's take an example. Imagine you are driving on the road and feeling hungry. I am feeling hungry. Here are some options. I will go with McDonald's and order my regular. Okay, I will go with McDonald's. Booking confirmed at 12 p.m. Based on your tasks, you have 20 minutes to finish your lunch at McDonald's. You are reaching McDonald's. Payment done. Reserved a parking at B2, A1. Reaching destination. Table number 6 is reserved. Your food is ready. You also got an additional discount of 5% for on-time arrival. Destination reached. Enjoy your meal. So what we have seen in the video is that the retailers in the neighborhood where I'm passing by are able to reach me with their personalized ads. <coughs> the retailers like a car wash company, a, a boutique store which is selling clothes, or even an ice cream parlor will now be having the power to be able to program and push an ad to the client of their choice in their location at that particular time. That's interesting. And <coughs> the retailer will not, be, will not only have the authority and power to be able to program these ads based on my situation or my buying preferences, but also based on his inventory and his situation at that particular time, at that particular location. What we have seen here is the ads being delivered over a car's infotainment system. But that's not a limitation. The, the concept and solution as such will enable you to push ads over any device. Be it, be your, in a sh uh, as an example, if you're on a mobile device in a shopping mall, the ads will be able to, the ads will be pushed. Or you're walking in a supermarket through different aisles, then the ads can be pushed to the mobile device as well. <coughs> to deliver this concept, we looked at what are, what are the building blocks that are needed for, from a technology point of view. What we see is the need for higher bandwidth. The ads are already becoming more and more creative and more and more rich. And in the future, we see the ads would become 4K, 8K enabled, which means to deliver these kind of ads, we need a technology which, which offers higher bandwidth. Today's technology, unfortunately, would not be able to offer that. The second functionality that we would need is a low latency. The time from when the user asks for those ads to the time when the ad is being pushed is few seconds or few microseconds. And the kind of data that has to be processed during this time and curated during this time is very, very small. 
So the latency of the network is expect, is, we expect the latency of the network to be very, very small. And the third one is a massive machine-to-machine -machine communication. Again, here we have seen the cars should be able to communicate with the different infrastructures to be able to process those ads and to be able to deliver the service that the user is asking. And we believe 5G is the technology which will actually bring all of these together and make, make the concept be realized. We use multiple technologies or multiple features of 5G and other futuristic technologies. Uh, at this time, I also want to thank the 5G Hub for giving us an opportunity to validate our assumptions and solutions with the expertise from the 5G Hub itself. Uh, to deliver this solution, we, we expect that most of the processing will happen at the mobile edge uh, because the ad has to be delivered at low latency. Web, WebXR, to be able to create those ads, uh, high-definition ads, V2X, again, as I explained, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication or multi multiple message communication. Hyper-personalized experience based on the different data inputs that, that are being collected. And federated AI, which will take the AI and machine learning to the next level. What we see is that anybody who is working to improve the user experience benefits from the ecosystem players. In this example, the benefit that the retailer got was obvious. In fact, we believe that this could be a game changer for micro retailing. Today, the giants have huge uh, advertising budgets, but this will enable the micro retailers to be able to have a level playing field with bigger players as well. Uh, in terms of pro hosting providers, we believe that uh, <coughs> any auto OEM or anybody who's providing services on the auto, like a car rental company or a car, uh, sh car sharing company, will be able to host this solution and deliver value-added services to their customers. In fact, these can be even provided by a mapping service provider like a Google or a TomTom, who are always looking for adding value-added services to their customers. They're not just adding value-added services to their customers, but also creating alternate revenue channels for themselves as well. Uh, from a technology provider like Ericsson kind of company, we see that more and more such use cases will only accelerate the adoption of 5G, which is similar to what we have seen in 4G as well. At Tata Alexi, we have already started realizing this concept, and we have created some building blocks in terms of a service delivery platform, uh, ad delivery platform, or ad delivery uh, technology, and we also have an edge orchestration solution called the TUSM. So we have all the building blocks, and along with 5G Hub, we believe that we will be able to host this solution, create a proof of concept, and test this in the labs. <laughs> along, with Tata, uh, along with 5G Hub, Tata Alexi believes that we will be able to redefine the ad, ad delivery of the future. Thank you. I'm here with one of the 5G Hub's program board managers, our very own Iris Herstenberg. It is. Uh, which uh, benefits do you see with ephemeral ads? Well, what's central for me for the whole presentation is adding value. Adding value as Tata Alexi for the 5G Hub ecosystem, but also adding value as a solution to so many brands. Um, yeah, so I see a lot of possibilities. Excellent. And now, talking about the deliberation you guys have later on, in which aspects do you focus on when you assess the teams? Hmm. Well, for me personally, creativity um, is one of the things I focus on. So what does Data Alexi and their solution bring that is different than any other in the market? Um, not only locally, not only um, in the country, but maybe even globally. Um, and the eagerness to drive this and to go the extra mile. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Uh, the final pitch, pitch presents a smart integrated thermal battery that optimizes power consumption. Please welcome VoteHood. Yeah, so currently only 19.7% of the electricity produced in the Netherlands is renewable. And as you can see, it's just a tiny portion of the total produced electricity. We have set the goal to reach 70% by 2030. But as you can see, there's a long way to go. First, we will need to add more renewables on the grid. But this is not enough. We need to add more and more. And then a power blackout. If we do not make use of flexibility, 
we will experience power blackouts more and more often. And this is already reality in the United States. Last year, between June and August, in California, only nine power blackouts happened, affecting millions of people. My name is Horst, and this is Tom, and we have a bright idea. What if we can solve this to the smart control of electric assets? In this way, we can match the demand of electricity to the supply of renewables, also called demand response management. But we need flexibility for this. And that's actually exactly what our platform does. We unlock the power flexibility of a heat pump and use this to provide congestion management and balancing services to grid operators and energy suppliers. On the other hand, we reduce the energy bill of the consumers, of the households, and we reduce their CO2 footprint of their consumption. And we also trigger them to compete and offer more flex in our gamified app that provides insights. So how does it work? First of all, we have insight in the real-time data of renewables active on the grid. And based on our AI forecasting algorithms, we can optimize the consumption of our swarm of heat pumps. And because we have a real-time connection with them, we can activate and deactivate them whenever necessary. So when there is an excess of renewables on the electricity grid, we can activate uh, heat pumps in order to restore the balance. But also the other way around. When there is a shortage of renewables, we can deactivate heat pumps if possible, and thereby we harness the full potential of the renewable en uh, energy production units. So why 5G? With our platform, we are not talking about eight heat pumps, nor about hundreds of heat pumps. We are talking about millions of heat pumps. And actually, in 2030, it's estimated that more than six million heat pumps will be installed, meaning that we have to deal with a huge amount of traffic, and missing only thousands of heat pumps will already as an equivalent of one megawatt flexible power that is lost. And therefore, we need a very reliable connection, and that's where 5G comes in. So today, I brought our very first prototype. And with this device, we're going to change the energy industry. You just simply connect it to your heat pump, to your smart meter, and you're ready and set to go. Using our app, we provide insights into your energy consumption and see how well you are helping the environment. But you also can compete and see the cost reductions that you have saved due to the, due to the flexibility of your heat pump. We also provide access to servicing. So if your heat pump needs servicing, you can get in touch through our app and get a checkup for your heat pump. Actually, it's everything you need for your heat pump, the most consuming asset in your house, in the palm of your hand. But do people want it? And the answer is yes. Out of more than 30 interviews that we have conducted with households, over 95% agreed to make use of our servers and already signed up. For instance, Hein and Avi. Hein and Avi, when they make use of Voltgoed, they would have an, a, a way to be more sustainable in an easy and affordable manner. But those are not the only ones we are interested. We have spoken to many HIPA manufacturers, and one of them is Peter van Gameren, director of Ito Daderop, and they are also wanting to support us in connecting their HIPAMs to our platform. Also, Maarten Sonnenveld from Nibe recognizes the potential the flexibility of a heat pump has. So let's look at the market. The in the market, the number of installed heat pumps is growing exponentially. Actually, last week the CBS published the numbers and it turned out that in 2020 more than 800,000 heat pumps were installed, meaning that it's almost that it more than doubled in nearly two years. And this has also a great value because an research from Accenture estimates that this value will be equivalent to 180 million euros. And with fault good, we want to harness that. So let's look at the steps we have taken so far. Five weeks ago, we presented for the first time our concept at the jury of the 5G Hub. And since then, we made huge steps. First of all, we updated our first prototype, which is now active at several households in the region. We launched our website, and as of this morning, more than 42 people signed up to participate on our platform. We won the Impulse Challenge organized by DSO Inexus, the grid operator, and we also won the TOE contest in the ideation phase. Vodafone is introducing us to, or Vodafone Ziggo is introducing us to Ineco, 
and we went from 30 plus interviews to 60 plus interviews with our stakeholders, energy suppliers, heat pump manufacturers and households. But there's more to come. First of all, we want to build our first demonstrator in collaboration with a heat pump manufacturer. We want to implement a 5G module in order to communicate in real time with the heat pump. Uh, and at the end of next year, we want to uh, start our first prototype, uh, our first pilot with 200 households. And this roadmap is designed for the next eight months. But with the help of the partners of the 5G app, we will we'll be able to shrink this down to six months. And therefore, we can already start our pilot this year. So a little bit more about the team, because I believe the team is way more important than the idea at first. Let's start off with Jasper. Jasper joined the solar team for two years and was responsible for the hard and software development of the battery. So you could say he's quite experienced with those kind of things. Then Stan did his internship at Van der Bon, the energy supplier, on the curtailment of wind turbines. So that means switching off wind turbines. And that's what, when we realized, realized we need a serious change in the way we consume electricity. Due to my experience within a different startup, we decided to join forces and start Voltgoed and make it a success. But we're not the only one that believe in our proposition. People from the industry do too. Take, for instance, Hans van Halpen, who was 12 years the CEO of Engie, and he sees the potential of our product and service. But also Maarten Roels, founder of Easy Energy, and Alexander Savokal, managing energy transition at Ampels. But not only people from the industry are interested, also the households. Take, for instance, Marcel, Willem, Ruben, Gert Jan, they all signed up already and want to participate in our platform. So the question is do you believe? and our proposition too. Join us on our mission to make households the enablers of the energy transition. My name, my name is Horst, and this is Voltgoed. I'm joined now by Jorik Kramer, Sector Manager for Industry at Habo Bank. Jorik, uh, why is Voltgoed's project innovative? Well, in, uh, in order to, uh, to reach our climate goals, uh, there are two major trends in industry. Uh, on the one hand, you see the renewables, uh, like solar, like wind energy, connected to the grid. On the other hand, you see uh, more elect electricity usage uh, because of the electrification within industry. But this causes problems uh, for the grid, like they uh, stated. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, unbalanced, it's, uh, uh, there's congestion. And the, the, the the platform that Voltgoed actually uh, provides a, a, a very fast solution to unburden the network um, to uh, make it more reliable. So I think that's why this, his, their idea is so interesting. Okay. And uh, how important is the contribution of consumers towards a more sustainable world? Uh, well, I think it's very, very important. It's not only the big corporates, it's not only the government, but it's uh, smaller companies and it's like it's for uh, individual consumers like you and me. Uh, we also have to cont contribute to reach those climate goals. Um, uh, households still make up, uh, are still good for 15% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And it's such a cliche, but a, a better world starts at yourself. So yes, we, you and me, we, also, we all have uh, our own respons responsibility to contribute to uh, uh, reaching the climate goals. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And you've been with us since the first uh, session uh, from the feedback sessions, right? Yes. So what has been your favorite aspect of the 5G Hub Innovation Challenge? And there are many favorite aspects, but the, the most favorite aspect is that um, uh, the ideas that we heard, uh, they are so, such diverse. They are, uh, the diversity of the ideas is, is it's the most interesting uh, aspect of this challenge. Uh, we heard ideas from sustainable entertainment, uh, sustainable uh, harvest, uh, uh, crop harvesting, um, all ideas that make use of 5G technology to make our world a little bit of a better place. Um, so uh, I think we need more challenges like these to generate the ideas that make our world a better place that we can live in. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I know okay. that you and your peers have something very important to do now. I know, I know. So I'll let you go. Okay, but one more round of applause for the contestants. Oh, yes, yes? perfect. Okay. Please. <laughs> And now it's time for deliberation. So to start with, uh, our audience can quickly go to menti.com and insert the code you see on the screen, 64828426, and vote for your favorite team.
So you only have about 10 minutes to vote, so please do it now. Uh, our jury members are now heading to a separate room because they have a very important decision to make, while us are going to be enjoying a very, very inspiring talk by our fantastic guest speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, directly from Sweden, Shampa Bari. Hello, I hope the connection is working and that you can hear me fine, which are the most uh, used words of the past uh, year, I would say. I am very happy to be here. Thank you for giving me the floor. And I'm quite happy that I'm not, not right now deliberating with the, uh, with the jury members because this would have been a very, very fat, difficult choice, I think, for us to make. Uh, thank you for the pitches. They were very inspiring. Um, having been an entrepreneur myself, I know how difficult it is also to get in front of the stage and, and uh, to be able to give uh, this kind of uh, pitch in such a short time in front of an audience that uh, you think is judging you and who will be judging you at the end of the day. So I'm wishing all of the uh, all of the finalists uh, the very best of luck because all five of these solutions I thought were very very uh, useful, interesting, and inspiring. Um, and part of what we do here at Ericsson is, of course, working in 5G, and it was quite nice to, to hear them pitch 5G better than I ever could. Um, I mean, uh, Danny and Bart did a, did a better job than I think I do in many of my meetings and why 5G is going to be game-changing in so many ways. But I wanted to start with just a few words about being an entrepreneur. I often say that I'm an accidental entrepreneur myself. I got into it because of the 2008 recession. Uh, my plan had been to do an MBA and switch from the public sector, working in emergency aid, to working in mining. That was my big goal. Uh, but I couldn't find a job, so I became an accidental entrepreneur and ended up working in healthcare, using IoT devices with the advent of 3G, and wondering how we could then um, bridge the cap gap between the care that you get in hospitals and the care that you should be getting at home or being able to provide yourself with the preventive care that you need. I uh, thought that the journey of being an entrepreneur was fascinating. I loved working in the startup sector. But I think after having been in this for about 10 years, it's really not about the runway, the pitch deck, the Series A or the seed funding, the go-to-market, ecosystem, unicorn, all of the buzzwords that we hear. What it ends up ends up being about. It's about Melanie. It's about Martin. It's about Arun who pitched, um, Horst and, and Stan and Danny and Bart, um, Sena and, and Stefan, my colleagues at Ericsson working at the 5G hub, um, and with uh, Renee and Leticia's support, uh, being able to make this happen as well. It's about the people. Um, and I think uh, Horst at the Gold uh, Good said it um, better than I could that the team is very important. Um, both in the beginning and I think throughout this journey. So with that, I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, I, I hope that the screen sharing works. If not, um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, presentations and PowerPoint plus, uh, PowerPoints are not why we're here. We are here to create innovation and it doesn't happen on the screen. Um, so my journey with Ericsson started um, at about uh, a couple, actually just less than a year ago. And I have been very fortunate to be able to be a part of this, uh, of this uh, really old historic organization that's been around. But I think what is really important to remember here is that we also uh, quite literally started in a garage. Um, and it was 1876. I, of course, can't claim that I was around then, but we started working with uh, providing people with a service that they needed um, and did it in the most logical, uh, cheap, and fast way possible. And I think Ericsson has, throughout the years, retained a little bit or much of this entrepreneurial spirit. But as you well know, about 10 years ago, I think we um, underwent, after having been around for, for more than 100 years, uh, we were, I think, maybe too comfortable in the position we were in, and we needed to find that hunger again. Um, our numbers had begun to drop. We needed to find better ways and bigger ways of unleashing those game-changing ideas that had created Ericsson to what it is today to begin with. Uh, I have the fortune to work with 100,000 colleagues around the world, and 
if not all of them, most of them are entrepreneurs in their heart, maybe accidental ones like me um, at their heart. And our goal at Ericsson One is to figure out how we can help them realize those ideas that they have that they might be talking about around the water cooler or right now, you know, over Teams meetings to realize that into a biz the business um, potential that it has or doesn't. So Ericsson was one was created in our new um, emerging businesses um, uh, business area uh, about three years ago. And we sit across three hubs. I'm calling in from Stockholm, but we're also in Silicon Valley and in Beijing. And we source ideas globally from all of these locations um, and work really closely with our intrapreneurs to see how we can help them take whatever idea they have and build a business case around it. So these intrapreneurs are really the inspiration for, for us to create this structured innovation process. And I would argue that innovation is maybe best done in a very messy fashion. But on the other hand, I think when you're trying to commercialize it and bring it to market, it's very important to have something uh, where the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs feel safe and feel like they get the support that they need and they understand the journey uh, and the people around them understand what stage they're at as well. So here we have basically copied quite shamelessly with what uh, can be found um, in any startup ecosystem around the world. I mean, Dragon's Den, I did not create these, uh, <laughs> these names. Dragon's Den is not at all like what you see on TV. It's actually very friendly and nice. Um, but it is a, a process wherein Ericsson itself invests in the entrepreneurs that we know we have around the organization. We, of course, have an R&D unit. We have innovation hubs such as the one you're sitting at now. Uh, we have a garage and studios all around the world that um, create innovative ideas. But the idea with Ericsson One is how to take that through, invest in it in the stages that you see in the external ecosystem, uh, and uh, create that business or the product around it to be able to take it out on market. And this cannot be done without our partners. And that's where the dialogue becomes really important as, as I think it was, I'm, I'm not sure which of the oddbot um, speakers had said this, but it's like the oddbot robots, we need to learn from each other uh, and, and have those dialogues and then make sure that we're bringing the products onto market that are actually really relevant, that are, that are uh, the type of uh, value add solutions that our end users and our customers um, and partners are looking for, uh, and that can scale globally. So that's the process that we follow. We invest in different stages. We help create the prototype and, and the MVP, but we do not do this journey alone. We work with our customers um, and have a very rich ongoing dialogue with them. And we also actually, in certain parts of this, work with uh, with startups as well, who might be way more forward in some of the thinking that they have, like we've seen here today. I don't think we'd ever do the things that, you know, Maximus is doing with the growth all by ourselves. But we can maybe then provide that connectivity pieces um, that are needed to be able to make sure that we can take it out on market and commercialize it. And here, commercialization is not about making money, of course, it's great if we make a shit ton of money all over the place, but that's not the goal. The idea is financial viability because if it doesn't work and nobody is making anything out of it and at getting value back from it, then these are projects that will have to be closed um, or startups that will have to fall. We do need to, to ensure that every actor um, can make what they need to, to, to take the, the products and solutions to the next stage and make sure that they're viable and that they can live on. And this process, as I have hinted, is not, not easy. There are a lot of quote unquote failures around, along the way and a lot of learnings. We have at Ericsson about 10,000 people that we have reached um, out to within that's t almost 1% uh, of the organization, 10% um, of the organization actually. Um, and we have a lot of ideas in, in our idea drop. Um, we have uh, we have about out of the 2,000 we've had, we've um, invested in more than 120 of them. But in the pipeline, after these two and a half, three years, we have five that are viable projects. So there's a lot of learnings along the way. And I think that's where the relationships become even more important because you need to have those strong relationships to be able to give each other bad news as well when projects need to be closed or you know you have to be able to pivot and maybe combine projects um, uh, in the course of this journey.
So it's a, the perennial problem of expectation versus re, uh, reality. And this is something that, again, we can't do alone. We provide a lot of the connectivity from Ericsson's side uh, on our end. And of course, we understand our products and technology really well. But how it's used when it's you know, free in the public is something completely different. So that's what we're exploring now with 5G. And that's why it's so inspiring to hear the pitches from these, uh, these amazing five startups that are among the few who uh, made it among the best uh, of those that are working with the technology that we enable uh, along with our partners and customers. So I'm going to end um, and leave a little bit of time for questions uh, in, in this journey, what we've learned, um, what works and what, what hasn't worked. Uh, the leadership buy-in, I think, for us has been very important. Uh, once we get to the final stage of our process, we pitch in front of our CEO. Um, before that, of course, we have to pitch to our CFO, the head of BTEP, um, to make sure we're not putting something out on market that doesn't make sense for Ericsson, um, that we put something on market where we have clear commercial traction as well. Um, what also has been, in fact, something we've been able to leverage from, uh, from Corona has been having teams that are spread across our region. So we have people sitting in Romania working with people sitting in Morocco that com have complementary skills that are working on the projects. And yes, innovation is slower then, but we've been able to get much more diversity of thought. And that's where the, you know, the, the scope of what we're able to achieve becomes much, much greater. Um, so I think that has been, in fact, something that we shouldn't take lightly in these digital times. It's been great to be able to, even had it been slow, um, been great to be able to, to leverage the, the intellectual capacity that we have uh, globally. What hasn't worked, um, and this is not only for us, but it's the extensive tech focus. We can't be too in love with our technology. Um, we need to also take into account the feedback that we get um, and also not, and this is something I would like to say to the start, uh, startups as well, not to focus on one big customer uh, because that often kills what you're doing uh, if you're over customizing for one particular person. I think it's, I know it's easy to say when you need the funds and you're getting it, but that's something I learned when I was working at um, my startup is that you can't focus too much um, on, on one. Um, that said, I'm going to leave you with a short video where I think the sound is not going to work um, about our, our um, collaboration on, on a drone project. I will actually post this um, uh, is we're working with a startup here called Air Pelago as well, um, and we're working with Telia and our own drone uh, mobility project. Uh, but I'll post this video so that you can um, take a look at it after uh, we have had a chance to have a short question and answer and when we find out where who the winner of today is. With that, I think I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to you, Leticia, because I think this um, this is better maybe if you watch it on your own. Thank you so much. I just wanted to give you an example of the type of collaborations and projects we, um, we do here at Ericsson One. Thank you for your time. Hi, Shampa. Hello. Hi. How are you? It's so nice to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you. I was so nervous. It's very difficult when you can't see the public, so I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yes, we did. You did great. <laughs> and how did you enjoy the pitches? I really thought they were very well done. They were short and they kept to their time, which is always very important, um, unfortunately. Uh, but I thought they did a very good job pitching and they stuck with it. They really hit all the notes, why we're doing it, how they're doing it, um, how it's going to change um, the way we do things now. So well done. All of the pitches were excellent. And I'm really glad I'm not deliberating right now because I don't think I could choose one of them for, as, a, as a winner. And uh, as a tech innovation evangelist, uh, do you have a good piece of advice to share with our contestants? Um, again, I think it is, and I think they know this because it was mentioned by Walt God as well, um, it's really about the people. I think innovation is also about the people. It's about the people that you're helping. It's the people that you're working with. It's the people on the team um, that uh, you have recruited. Uh, and sometimes it can seem like... Uh, these become obstacles when you're trying to persuade people, when you're trying to get money. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's not about the technology, but it's about what you're trying to do and how you're going to, how your innovation and solution is going to affect the lives of others, whether they're working for it, whether they're working with it, or whether they're benefiting from it at the end of the day. 
So I hope again that uh, that uh, the startups will be able to reach their end users and get that feedback um, and uh, and produce the solutions that are necessary for you know for the growth of our economy and our our innovation ecosystem. I also want to see what they can do with 5G. Shampa, <laughs> thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Keep your fingers crossed for your favorite team, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you so much, Rafiqia. It was a pleasure to be here. All right, so I heard the audience has spoken. Can I have the results, please? Ooh. And the winner of the audience choice is Votehood. Come on up. Give the microphone, please. Give the microphone. Oh, never mind. So, this is yours. <laughs> Thanks. And this is also yours. Oh, nice. How does it feel? Yeah, amazing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's a. I think it also shows. Um, we, 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 within the startup, we try to have the, the consumer and the people as a focus as well to design a proposition around it. And I think that we win the fact that we win the audience prize also shows that we have strong focus for them. Um, so that's nice to, uh, to see back in the results. That's right. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to call up on stage the people who have worked so hard to make all this happen. Please come up, the 5G Hub Innovation Challenge team. And a big round of applause to them. Yes, um, thank you, first of all, for hosting this, uh, this event. Um, but first I want to start by thanking the teams, actually. Um, I think you made this challenge to a great success, uh, mainly because of your effort, uh, the work that you put into uh, our communication going up and down, how can we help you, what do we do, um, how can we make uh, most use of this um, opportunity, actually. Uh, it's also something that you asked us, and it's really nice to see uh, all the effort that you put in, but also how far you've came since uh, this challenge started about two months ago. So it's really nice to see, um, and maybe it's, it's actually like Jorik said, I want another round of applause for the teams, because they did a great job. And of course, on my left is, uh, is the team, but we are a representation of the bigger ecosystem of the 5G hub. So besides our partners, Brainport, Marielle, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, but also Heite Campus, uh, which is represented by Victor, actually. Uh, Strict, also one of the, uh, our amazing partners in the 5G hub, here represented by Gerjan. And then we have Vodafone represented by René. Um, I, I myself, I'm from Ericsson. And we try to um, actually to make innovations work and to give people like you an opportunity. And um, I got the honor to announce the winner. And uh, that, it's always a tough moment, right? But I was thinking, and I wasn't there, but a, a jury member came up to me, Betsy. She said, Senna, it was really tough. I know they always say it, but it was really tough. Um, so, well, I can say it was really tough, the decision. Um, the winner of the challenge uh, gets a development program in the hub where we will support you uh, in developing your innovation uh, and to make it a, a fantastic uh, use case, a fantastic showcase. Uh, you will get help from Brainport in developing your solutions, six months guidance from Brainport. In addition, you will get a day full of consulting from Strict. So I think it's, uh, it's quite a price. Oh, and of course the champagne, not to forget. Yeah, yeah good. Um, well, let's announce the winner then. The winner of the 5G Hub Innovation Challenge is Oddbot. Come on stage, Martijn. Congratulations. Oh, I hope this is still working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is, and also, you need to hand it in, otherwise, Kajan won't allow you. Uh, yeah. 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 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel honored to uh, yeah, get, this, uh, to get this prize. I have already really appreciated the, um, uh, yeah, the, the events leading up to this uh, finals. So already uh, all the input and help was very, uh, yeah, uh, felt as a great support. So I look even uh, more forward to the, to the next steps and yeah, putting the solution out there and making it a uh, reality. So yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank you very it. much. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe good to know for all the teams, so not only uh, for the people at home, but uh, for all the teams, we have defined follow-up steps. Uh, we already did that um, before the finals on ways we want to help you. Uh, and also, of course, the area we are in, the Brainport region, the high-tech campus. Um, we have a lot of people standing ready uh, to help you further in your innovation. So uh, we'll still see each other. Don't worry about that. And thank you, audience, for, uh, for being here. Cool. And you can always reach out to the 5G Hub via our website, 5ghub.nl. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Cool.